Um, how about you, though? Are you happy to be here today? Um, good. Me too, me too. And uh, some of you will realize, you know this, that we're actually wrapping up the series that we've been in for the entire month now of January. The name of the series is called Come Together. And uh, the thing today is I'm going to kind of finish it all up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to review a little bit, finish it all up today, and then we're going to move on next Sunday to something that... Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to jump into, it's called Anxious for Nothing and how we deal with the stress and the worries in our lives. That begins next Sunday. But today we wrap it up, come together. And even as I, even as I, I, I get us to this place where we're finishing it up, in my mind, maybe it's just a preacher thing. Maybe it's a pastor's thing where you've preached a series and in your mind you're going, did it, did it, did it all mean anything? Did it move us in any way? Are we, is there a change that has taken place? Has it happened? Or, or is it just, you know, series after series, week after week, year after year? Um, is, is it kind of like a, you hear it, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't really sink in? That's a question that goes on in my mind. Maybe it goes on in the minds of all the pastors after they preach sermons. But, uh, but that's kind of where I sit today in this come together, the last part of it. Uh, series. Today we're talking about what I call the True Friend Challenge, and uh, it really has been this whole series about stepping out and finding a friend and being that friend to somebody who might not have a friend and loving them in the way that he has called us to love them so that we can make a difference in their lives and bring them to Jesus Christ. And so again, I go, did it, did it go from here down to here? Um, are we really moved at all by that? Uh, a pastor and a, a, a banker and a lawyer were all going deer hunting together. And uh, they all went deer hunting together. They all were sitting out in the woods, and they all had the rifles out ready, and then along comes a big buck. And all at the same time, they lift up their rifles, and they shoot, and the buck falls. And so quickly, they all run over to look at it and to, to, to see what, uh, who, who actually made the shot. And as they, they approach, the, the lawyer says, well, obviously, I'm the one who, ma who made the shot. This is my buck. And the pastor quickly goes, no, 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 no. I'm the one who made the shot. This is my buck. And then the banker, he said, no, you guys are both wrong. I'm the one who made the shot that took down the deer. This is my buck. And they begin to argue. They begin to argue amongst themselves. But after a little while, the warden comes along. The warden looks at him, he says, guys, what are you arguing about? And they all said, we're trying to figure out who actually made the shot to drop the buck. And the warden says, I bet I can help you out. And the warden went over and he stood over the deer. And just like that, he goes, I know who did it. They said, who? He said, well, obviously it's the pastor. The pastor is the one who shot the deer and dropped it. It's the pastor's deer. And they said, how in the world can you just look like that at that deer and tell that quick? And the warden said, well, it's obvious. Look closely. The bullet went in one ear and out the other. Yeah. <laughs> As a pastor, sometimes I wonder if that's what happens. That we hear the word, but the word doesn't sink in. That we, we, we read this and we have a, a head nod and yeah, that's good and way to go. And that's, that's a good idea, but it doesn't move us. Does it really move us? Does it really cause us uh, to, to step out, to be different, to change in any way at all? And, and so, so that's where we are here today. But, but in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, it says, A man who has friends must himself be friendly. Circle those words, be friendly. But there is a friend who sticks closer than brother or a true friend. But in order to have a true friend, in order to be a true friend, you have to be that, you have to step out. You yourself have to be friendly. Do you see right here that it's not something that is passive? And so many people in this life, we sit there and we go, I need something to happen to me. I need somebody to be my friend. I need this in my life. But instead, this is active. It is stepping out. It is being friendly and being that true friend to somebody else. Paul puts it this way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, starting in verse 19, even though I am free from the demands and expectations of everyone, and I just kind of put in parentheses, Paul's not a people pleaser. Uh, a lot of people who are Christians think that being a good Christian means you have to be a people pleaser, but that's simply not the case. And Paul's saying, I'm not a people pleaser. Don't get me wrong here. 
He says, I instead have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious people, non-religious, meticulous moralists, loose living immoralists, the defeated and the demoralized, whoever, Paul says. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world. You see? active. He's stepping out. I entered their world. He's moving. I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. Why? Here's the reason. Here's what moves us. I did all this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. He's saying, I did all this because of the gospel, the message, the good news. That's what moves me. That's what compels me. First Corinthians chapter, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, I am compelled, I am moved by the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of Christ compels me. Does it compel you? Has it moved you? Has it caused you to step out? Has it caused you to be different? Has it caused you to go to a place that you wouldn't re- normally go to? Has it caused you to talk to somebody you might not normally talk to? Has it caused you, compelled you in the same way to be the friend that, that somebody needs in order for them to be able to hear the good news of Jesus Christ? Or is it in one ear, out the other? Is it a good idea, but it hasn't moved the heart? You see, I've discovered... I've discovered the only reason oftentimes that we ever move is not because we have it up here, but because we have it here. It has to sink in here. It can't just be a good idea in our head. It has to, it has to touch our heart. It has to move our hearts. It has to impact us. And when that happens, that's what compels us. That's what causes us to go. I'm going to ask you to do something right now. And a lot of you are going to be very mad at me by this, okay? I want you to get up and find a different seat than the one you're sitting in right now. Yeah, uh, go ahead, everybody, everybody. Even if it's one seat over, even if it's across the, over there, every, different seat, different seat, different seat. Mm-hmm. Different seat, different seat. All right, let me tell you what just happened right there. What just happened is some of you got really, really mad at me. Some of you are like, I ain't doing nothing. You can't make me. I ain't moving my seat. This is my seat. I sit in this seat every Sunday. I own this seat. I get up early, get here early so I can get in this seat so nobody will get my seat. And now you go ask us to move. I don't like it. And so you, you got this anger thing going towards me right now, right? I ain't never coming back here no more. <laughs> I'll show him. Yeah, yeah, you got this anger thing. Anger thing going towards me. He just made us move. He made us all move. He made me get out of my, get out of my seat and go sit in another seat. What a jerk. Yeah, you're mad. You're mad. You're mad. You know why you're mad? You're upset, you're mad because that was your comfort zone. That was your comfort zone. Ooh, I like my comfort zone. I like where I sit. This is the only place I can sit. I I, I don't think I'm going to be able to hear another word he says this morning. (laughs) Because I'm not in my comfort zone. I'm not in my seat, you see. And it was interesting. The same thing goes in Scripture, in God's Word, and there's a command, and we've been given a command. And the command is love your neighbor as yourself. But some of us, we hear, we go, that's a good idea, but I ain't moving out of my seat. (laughs) It's a command, and if it's a command, (sighs) well, if we were honest, we'd just be getting a little upset at the one who commanded us to move. If... There's no love. If no love is involved. You see, you see uh, uh, just yesterday, just yesterday, I'm in the kitchen, I'm in the kitchen, and Kim goes, she gets this big bag of trash, and she ties it up, and she goes, I need you to take this. Will you take this out to the garage and put it in the trash can for me? I was like, uh-uh. 
take out your own trash. Now, you know I didn't say that, right? <laughs> you're like, man, you wouldn't be standing here today if you said that. And you're right. No, I didn't say that. I was like, yes, ma'am. Grabbed that thing, took it right out. Did I do it because I had to? Well, kind of, but. <laughs> you know the real reason? The real reason behind it all is because the one who loved me asked me to do it. And the one I love, I want to do it for. And it's a love motivation, not a command, not a demanding motivation, not just because you got to. But so many of us are living the Christian life with the, oh, I guess I got to. I don't want to, but I got to because he said I got to. And there's no love in it at all. There's no motivation of love at all. And, and, and you know what John said about it? In 1 John, he goes, okay, here's the deal. You're going to get real. If, if, if you're doing things and it's not out of just simply because you love him and what he has done, it's so impacted your life. It's so touched your heart. If you're doing it out of, out of because you got to, or maybe out of because routine, or maybe that's because what's expected. And he says, look carefully, look deep, because the truth is God's love is really not in you at all. You're faking. You're faking. There's no, if, it's, if, it's, if it's a drudge, if it's, ah, I don't, I don't want to move, I don't want to do this, I've got to do, if, if that's it at all, if you look at your heart and, and it's, then, then he's saying there's no love. There's no love. Love is the motivation. Love is the very thing that catapults us. Love, the love of Christ has to compel us. And if it's not compelling us, if I find myself year after year, day after day, hearing a sermon is still sitting, man. Just if, 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 it, if it's I, I hear the word of God and, and all I do is nod my head, but it really doesn't move me, then the truth about it is there's no love of God in me. John, John said, don't you dare, don't you dare uh, look at somebody in need and, and, and say that you love God and not help that person in need. He said, because really you're just lying. And so, so we find ourselves in this place where, where our hearts are exposed. Has it really, has the love of Christ, has, has what he has done for me on the cross with his shed blood poured out his life, has that really sunk in so much that that love for him compels me, compels me to love, 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 love. Love my neighbor. Father, we ask that you will expose our hearts, show us what it, what, what, what it really is all about. Oh, how we get, we get so tied up in, in all the, the fundamentals and all the rules and all the regulations and all the you ought to do this and you ought to do that. And Father, when it gets down to it, if we're not being obedient and loving others because you commanded that, then, then we're just, we just play church. We just pretend. We just fool, fool ourselves. Father, no, instead, have your way with us finally, Father. Would you, would you find hearts surrendered completely to you to be able to be willing to go, to step out, to be a friend to those who desperately need the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. Help us in that. Help us in that, we pray. Father, I pray as the challenge is given this morning that the challenge will be accepted, not because we got to, but because we are so deeply in love with you. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so here is the challenge. I want to lay it out for you here this morning. It's what we see Paul doing right here. And there are four things I want you to write down in this challenge. But here's how we're going to break it down this morning. The, the true friend challenge is a bunch of I wills, and the number one is this. I will, number one, be a friend to those God has put around me. I will be a friend to those God has put around me or in my path. Matthew twenty two thirty nine, 39, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. And obviously you guys, if you're in the series, you know, we were talking about the Good Samaritan and that there was a teacher of the law, a religious scholar 
who comes, and uh, he had been studying the law, and the Pharisees put him up to it. They said, hey, see if you can trip, trip him up a little bit. And he asked this question. He says, what's the greatest? And, and Jesus says, you tell me, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he asks the next question. He says, okay, then, but who is my neighbor? And that's where Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Those of you who know the story, or if you've heard the story, you'll remember in the story that Jesus Jesus, the story Jesus tells, he, tell, he talks about a road, and he says there was this man traveling down this road, and some robbers jumped out, and they beat him uh, to an inch of his life, and they stripped him of his clothes and all the stuff that he had. They left him there in the ditch lying for dead. And he said, then along comes, and, and basically the picture you get right here is along comes a preacher or a priest or a religious uh, man in the temple. And uh, the guy's laying there, and he says, but the, the preacher or the priest uh, steps by and, and goes to the other side of the road and leaves the man laying right there. And, 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 and you know, it's one of those things, you go, how could a preacher do that? But the truth is, when you think about the story, well, that was a dangerous road Jesus talks about. And the priest, I mean, it's probably pretty smart. I mean, if the guy's laying there and, and, and he's about to die, well, it's very possible that, that the robbers are still close by. And if the robbers are close by, then he could be putting himself in danger himself. But, but, and so we kind of rationalize that out and we go, oh, man, you know, when I see something, I got to be really careful. I got to watch out in the same way as the priest. In other words, there's somebody in my path and he's put this person in my path and I step by on the other side. And so he brings us to that place, you and I, all of us, where we have to ask the question, who has God put in my path? Who has God brought into my life? Who has he put there for a reason, for a purpose? Who is my neighbor? Who are those who are near me? When we say near me, I want you to think really near to you. There's a TV show. I'm going to really date myself. And we were talking about this in staff meeting this last week. There's a TV show that I watched when I was a kid. Um, see how many of you remember this TV show. It was called Romper Room. Any of it? Yeah? All those who remember Romper Room, raise your hand, okay? All those who have no idea what Romper Room was. Yeah, oh, look at that, wow. Oh, man, I'm getting so old. Um, but the, if, if you don't, didn't know Romper Room, you're not missing anything, okay? Um, but I loved it as a kid. I loved it as a kid. And the way the show would begin every day was uh, uh, this lady would begin the show. She'd pull out what was called the magic mirror. And it was not really a mirror at all. It was just the shape of a mirror where she could look through it, you know. And she would look in her mirror and she would start to call out the names of the children who were watching through the TV. Well, it was magical. You can do it, you know. And she would, she would start calling out names and she'd say, oh, today I see Billy and today I see Susan. Oh, and I also see Jimmy. And she's saying all these names, but, but she never said Bo. <laughs> what gives, man? And I, was, I watched every day hoping that she would say Bo. But she never said Bo. I thought, how can it be? I'm here. I'm here. It was a magic mirror, man. Come on. I'm here. And she never saw me. Uh, the reason I, I, I tell you that is because we, 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 we're so accustomed to sitting in our chair and to be in our comfort zone that we go through life day in and day out without ever really seeing some people. We don't see them. We don't see them. Your neighbor... Perhaps your neighbor today. Maybe, guys, it could be that wife of yours. You see, there's probably a woman sitting here today who, who's saying, my husband hadn't seen me in 20 years. He used, to, he used to see me, but I feel like he doesn't see me anymore. And she's desperate, desperate for that love. Or maybe maybe it's, it's, it's a child in here going, oh, man, I've been dying for my dad to see me. But, but he's busy. He's so busy. He doesn't, he, he doesn't, I don't feel like he's ever. 
Or, or maybe it's that, that, that coworker that, that well, just doesn't quite fit in. And everybody there, they, well, they have their, 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 their place to sit at lunch, and then this is their chair, and they don't get out of that chair. And because of that, there's that person that's been sitting over there by themselves for so long, and nobody really sees them. Or maybe, maybe it's in the classroom. It's in the classroom. And everybody's got their assigned seats. But in those assigned seats, there's that one student over there that never gets seen. And we can all, if we really start looking, if our eyes are really open, we can all really look out and start to see people the way that Jesus sees people. People that, that we, 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 if we see them, we, we, we're not, we're not going to step by them. They've been put there and they've been put in our path for a reason, for a purpose. But who are those? Who are those that not by accident, but, but God has actually dropped right there around you, put them into your life and he's put them there for a purpose? Who are those? And are you so willing to be moved and compelled by the love of Christ that he said, I want to be your friend, that you then go and say, he chose me to be his friend and in the same way, now I want to choose you to be my friend. Moved, moved, compelled. I will, I will be a friend to those God has put around me. So who is that? The second one I want to write down, number two, this morning, is I will be a friend to those that are in need and have no other friends. I will be a friend to those that are in need and have no other friends. I love the way Paul put it. He goes, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever, those are the people I'll be a friend to so that they can hear about Jesus. I tend to think that Jesus, above all else, is, uh, is the master of disguise. You remember those uh, movies, Mission Impossible? Any of you like those? Yeah, you remember Mission Impossible? And there was always the scene somewhere in there where you're watching it and you're just the last person you would ever expect and suddenly they reach back and they pull off the mask and you're like, no way. I had no idea it was them. I was so fooled by that. I can't believe it was them the whole time. And in the same way, I think, I think that we are going to all be surprised one day. I'll be surprised one day when suddenly Jesus goes, you know, it was me the whole time. It was me the whole time. How do I know that? Well, look at Matthew chapter 25, 35. He says, for I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. You see, you see what he's saying? He's saying all of these, all of these people that you look around and you see, and you see these people in need, just watch it. That is so sobering to me. That is scary to me. That's scary to me to think of how many people in my life I, I, I have disregarded or I have, I have looked, I've turned my back to. I've, I, I've said, no, I'm not getting out of my seat for you. That, that, that one of those people would suddenly, and wait, Jesus, I, if, if I knew it were you, Jesus, I wouldn't. I, hey, believe me, okay? If I knew it were you. But what kind of excuse would that be? What kind of excuse would that be? I was hungry. There's, there was your opportunity, Bo. I, went, I was hungry. I, I came to you hungry, and there was your opportunity. What kind of opportunity? An opportunity for you to be blessed in return. For you to participate, for you to move. There was your opportunity for you to love in the same way that I loved you. Did you miss it? I remember Kim and I, you know, I think I told you guys recently, we were driving through downtown Atlanta. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of little stop signs, little roads here and there, and we're driving through downtown. And uh, we come to this one uh, red light. We stop at this red light. And as soon as we stop at this red light, out of the corner of my eye, I see this guy. 
And he was standing there on the corner, and here he comes. Here he comes. He's heading towards the truck. And, and in my mind, I'm going, ah, no, he's going to ask me for, you know, some money or whatever. And, and so I, it's a little closer, and I roll the window down. And uh, he comes up, and he goes, hey, man, um, I hate to bother you, but you got any money? Uh, uh, I'm hungry. I haven't eaten. And, and what happens when that happens to you? In our minds, what do we do? We start to go, oh, I don't know. And we rationalize and we, we, we come up with reasons and, oh, you know, what's he going to do with it if I give it to him? Probably not anything good. And it's going to, and if I, if I give him something, I'm going to really ruin his life. And, and we come up with all these different things. But every once in a while, you get a little bit of a little voice, a little voice that says, wait a second now, wait a second now. You, you don't have to worry about all that. You don't have to worry about all that. You just worry about you doing what you need to do. And so in that, in that moment, here he is, and I'm like, all right. And I reach in my pocket, and I pull out whatever money I had in my pocket, and I put it in his hand, and, and it happened to be a pretty large bill. I know. And he looked at it, and when he looked at it, suddenly he goes, that's illegal. And I said, what's illegal? He goes, that is illegal, I tell you. And I'm like, what's illegal, man? And he goes, it's illegal that that woman sitting next to you looks as good as she does. <laughs> and suddenly Kim goes, give him more money. Give him more money. <laughs> we had a good laugh over that. I said, man, bless you. Appreciate it. And uh, he, he left. And, and we drove away from there. And as strange as it sounds, strange as it sounds, I feel like I got blessed in that moment more than I blessed him. And I think for so many of us, there are opportunities that he puts around us, puts around us. Jesus in disguise, where he simply wants to bless you. He wants to show you. He wants to work through you. I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was watching, I was watching a lot of people on Thursday night, I was here, and Kim and I sitting back here for the, I'm sorry, Thursday, Friday night, uh, for, the, for the throwback, and, and what an incredible show that was, but there was this one that got me, and I saw I get a lot of, a lot of you. Um, it was uh, kids standing up here, and they started singing, we are the world, we are the children, we are the ones, and, and, and as they're singing, suddenly the pictures come up. And my wife will tell you anytime that that just messes me all up. But, but uh, as, as those pictures are coming up, uh, I, I start to look around. I start to look around and I see, I see people all around me, tears starting to well up in their eyes. And, and then at the very, very end, how about that, where they finish singing and then there's a video and they're all singing the same song. And I think about it, I know the stories, and I know, I know the stories uh, probably more than you guys are able to know the stories right now, but I know the stories of those children and where they came from and some of the stuff that they've been through. And I was so excited to see that, that the congregation, the place was moved. And it's the love, it's the love that compels us, it's the love that moves us. And, and to imagine for one second that all those children up there, it's not just those children, it's, it's, it's Jesus. In disguise. In disguise. To be able to spot that and to see that. Do you see it's looking at the world in a different way? It's looking at everything around us. In a different, it's looking at people in a different way all around us that he's brought into our lives. And yes, yes, I will be a friend to those that are in need and have no other friends. I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Every once in a while I'll get asked to go visit somebody's family member in prison, in jail. And I'll do that. I, I, I went a little while back and uh, it, it, was, it was really interesting because when I got to the, the, the jail there, there's this window I had to go up to and and uh, these officers are behind this window and kind of speaking through this thing. And, and they said, sir, what are you doing here? And I tell them I'm uh, a pastor. I've been asked to come make a visit. And uh, when I did that, this, this guard in the back of the office suddenly turns around. And he goes, Pastor Bo. And, 
And I said, hey, how you doing? And he said, hey, come on, I'll take you. And uh, he ushered me to the place where I needed to go and puts me at this door. And, and he goes, stand here. And when the door opens, you go through. And then I'll close the door behind you. And then I'll buzz the next door open. And, and so <clears throat> door <laughs> slid open. And I stepped through and, and uh, <laughs> closed behind me. And <clears throat> this other door opens up. And I stepped through. And, and then I found myself. And I had been given instructions of where I needed to go and down certain hallways and, and what to do. And so I started kind of wandering around through through the jail, heading to the place where I was going to go meet this, this prisoner. And as I was walking, walking down the hallway, I looked down to my right, and there's this, there's this another hallway, and I looked on down, and there were like four or five uh, men down there in their jumpsuits, and, and I kind of looked at them, and next thing you know, one of the guys down there goes, Pastor Bo! And I was like, hey, man, what you been up to? And, oh. <laughs> so, so bad. He just kind of, ah, you know, not much. And I said, hey, good to see you, man. And so I continue walking on. And as I'm walking on, uh, there's another guy coming the opposite direction with a trash can. And suddenly he stops, looks at me and goes, Pastor Bo. And I was like, hey, man, how you doing? And, and, and I'm starting to go, now I know why church attendance has been low lately, you know. It's like, <laughs> what, what the... But I went and sat down, had a great talk, and eventually uh, I went back, and they buzzed me back out, and, and I, I leave the jail, and it just kind of hit, it hits me, it hits me. We think, we think, when we think of church, we think of a box right here where we all come together and we sit here on Sunday morning in our chair. But church is not just here, it's in the prison down there. Church is out on the streets in Atlanta. Church is all wherever God sends us to spread his love. That's where church is at. That's where church is at. I will be a friend to those that are in need and have no other friends. Number three, I will be a friend to those who don't like me. Even as you write it down, you're going, oh, are you kidding me? Seriously? It's like asking me to get out of my seat. I will be a friend to those who don't like me. Let me let, me let you on in, in a little secret, okay? Get, get this. You're not going to believe this. But um, not everybody likes me. <laughs> Somebody laughed a little too much on that one right there, okay? Um, not everybody likes me. And get this. Not everybody likes you. Not everybody likes you. And a lot of us spend our time trying to make people like us. And that's not what we're called to do. We're simply called to love those who don't like us. Love those who don't like us. Love those who are different than us. Love those, he says, look here. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy is what you've heard. Jesus says, I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Forgive Forgive. Heard about one pastor talking to his congregation one Sunday. He said, I want you all to raise your hand, whoever's willing to forgive your enemies. About 80% of the people raised their hand. and That wasn't good enough. So he said, no, 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 I'm going to ask again. Everybody who's willing to forgive their enemies, raise their hand. And he almost had 100% except for one man sitting right down here in the front. His name is Ed. And so he stopped and he said, listen, Ed, everybody else is willing to forgive their enemies. Why aren't you raising your hand? And Ed said, because I don't have any enemies. And he goes, Ed, are you sure about that? Stand up, Ed. And Ed stood up and he said, Ed, you say you don't have any enemies? How old are you, Ed? And Ed said, I'm 98 years old. He said, are you kidding me, Ed? You're 98 years old and you have no enemies? He goes, come on down to the front, Ed. He got Ed to walk down to the front. He said, Ed, you got you to share. You got to tell us all. How is it that you're 98 years old and you have no enemies? Ed gruffly spoke up and he said, because I outlived all those jerks. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about here, okay? Not what I'm talking about. Here, no, instead, instead he says, love those who hate you. Love those who persecute you. Pray for those. Pray for those who speak evil against you. Let, let me ask you a quick question. Is Jesus, as he's telling the story of the Good Samaritan, if he were to be telling the story of the Good Samaritan specifically to you, 
Who would be your Samaritan? Here, here's why I asked. Um, when Jesus is talking to, to, to uh, tell him the story of the Good Samaritan, he's talking to um, a group of Jews. And he chooses Samaritan because he knows how terribly hated the Samaritans are by the Jews and how much the Samaritans hate the Jews. Uh, you see, they, they believe, they worship different. They said you worship here and, 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 and not over here. And the Jews said you worship here and, and you don't worship over here. And not only that, they were, they were a different race. And they were despised, oh, they couldn't stand each other. They believed different, they acted different. And in fact, uh, in, in reality, a Samaritan would just as easily spit on a Jew or run over, run over a Jew with a horse instead of stop and help. And, and the same goes for the Jew with a Samaritan. And so that's why Jesus specifically chose the Samaritan. But suppose he's telling you the same story. Instead of the word Samaritan, who would he say for you? Who would he say for you? Could it be, could it be that, that, that for you, he would use somebody who's a different race to be your Samaritan? Could it be for you that, that he would use somebody who was raised different, who believes different? Or how about, that? How about this? Suppose, suppose he's telling the story of the Good Samaritan to you, and he says, uh, instead of along came a Samaritan, he says, along came a... Democrat. Oh, not a Democrat. Oh, are you kidding? Or maybe for you, long came a Republican. Oh, that's terrible. I can't think. Of... Maybe it's that. Who would he use for you? Maybe, maybe he would use somebody who ooh, you just you just can't stand anymore. Some of that, he'd use that friend who you were once a friend with and they did this to you and they're not a friend anymore. And along came this, or maybe it would be an ex. You know, I was treated so bad, but along comes, oh. who is it in your world that he would say along comes? He says, that's the one I'm talking about. That's the one, that's the one. I want you through my power and my strength because I so love you and you're compelled by my love to go and love, to love. Love even those who hate you, who don't like you. And finally, number four, I will. The first one is I will be a friend to those God has put around me. Second one, I will be a friend to those that are in need and have no other friends. I will be a friend to those who don't like me, number three. And then finally, simply this, I will be a friend to those that need Jesus. To those that need Jesus. Again, we talk about the audience and who it is that he was talking to. Jesus was talking to a group of the spiritual elites. Um, these were the guys who studied the Bible. In other words, a group of Pharisees or, or, or teachers of the law. Uh, he, might, he, might say, uh, uh, he might say he was talking to a group who's always, they're in a Bible study together. And they love to read the word of God together. That's how he's talking here. Here he might say he's talking to people who are always in church on Sunday. That's who he's speaking to and giving the Good Samaritan story to. He's talking to, but, but you see what's going on right here? He's saying you can be one of these people who do a lot of good things. You can do the good thing like going to Bible study and studying the word of God. You can do the good thing like going to Sunday school. You can do the good thing like going to church all the time. You can do all these good things and still not love somebody. And if that's the case, then you've missed it. You've completely missed it. You're doing all these good things, but you're basically good for nothing because you're not doing the commandment that I've commanded you to do is to love somebody. Love somebody. Love. Matthew eleven nineteen. 19, the son of man, Jesus said, on the other hand, feast and drinks, and you say, he's a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and other sinners, but wisdom is shown to be right by its results. What's going on? There's a group of people saying, Jesus, you're not doing this and this and this. You're doing it all wrong. You can't hang out with those type of people. You can't. And Jesus says, no, no, no. You've missed it. You've missed it. 
Look at the results. Look where this is going. The reason I'm their friend, the reason I'm hanging with these people is so that they can know the truth and it'll be the truth that sets them free so they can be saved, so they can have a friend for all of eternity in me. Let me, let me, let me go so far as to say this. Listen, guys, listen. If you don't have any friends who don't know Jesus, then I'm going to challenge you, get out of your seat. Get out of your seat. Go find friends who don't know Jesus and be their friend because that's why he still has you here. That's why he still has you here. Move out of your seat. May he move you, compel you by the love of God. One of my favorite stories, Tony Campala, a pastor, tells this story. And, and he, he, was, he actually flew to Hawaii. He was in, 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 uh, uh, in the city there in, in Hawaii. And uh, um, having flown uh, the great distance that he did, it kind of sets you off a little bit. Your, your body clock's not on. And so he finds himself uh, there at 3 o'clock in the morning, waking up in his hotel room and and not being able to go back to sleep, and also be, being very hungry. And so he said, uh, so he decides to go out and see if there was anything out there in the city that was open for him to eat, get a bite to eat. And, and so he starts wandering the streets, and he comes to this one little, uh, what he described as a greasy diner. And it was still open, and he goes inside and goes, pulls himself up to the, the counter and sits down there at the counter. And he, he described it, he goes, one of those places where he didn't feel like he should even touch the menu, you know, um, and not knowing what he might catch. But he looks, uh, there's a guy um, standing there who's, who's working the diner, and a and, uh, big guy, and turns around and says to Tony, what do you want? And Tony had thought he wanted eggs and bacon and so forth, but after seeing the grill and everything, he decides on a donut in a case over here. And he says, I'll, I'll have one of these donuts. And he said the big guy goes over there and wipes his hand like this, and Reaches in, grabs the donut, and puts it on his plate. Gives him a cup of coffee. And so Tony sits there um, at 3 o'clock, just sitting there eating his donut and drinking coffee. And about that time, there's, there's, there's some noise. And he, he looks over, and a bunch of women are coming in through the door. A bunch of women, they're loud and they're boisterous. And he quickly realizes that it's a bunch of women who, are, who, who have been working the streets, prostitutes, and they're getting off. Uh, for the night and, and coming in to the little diner right there. And, and they come in and pretty much surround him on each side as he's sitting there at the, at the bar. And as a pastor, he's going, I just need to get out of here. I just need to get out of here. But he listens to these ladies start to talk. And eventually one of the ladies says, you know what? Tomorrow is my birthday and I'm going to be 39 years old, says to another one of the ladies. And the other lady said back to her, so what do you want me to do? You want me to bake you a cake and sing you happy birthday or something? And that's when the, the girl who said it just in a sad way kind of said, no, I don't know why you got to be so mean all the time. No, I don't want you to sing happy birthday. No, I don't want a birthday cake. I've never had one in my whole life anyway. And he said it was that moment, that, that, that little voice. And so he had an idea. Eventually the ladies left and and as he's sitting there, he, he, he calls the, the guy who was behind the counter over, and it happened to be his name was Harry. He said, hey, uh, Harry, um, the, these ladies in here, do they come in here every night? And Harry's like, oh, yeah, every night, 3 o'clock on the dot, they're always here. He goes, how about the one who, who was sitting right He said, oh, that's Agnes. And uh, he goes, do you, do you know that, that um, tomorrow is Agnes's birthday? And uh, he goes, I, I just had a thought while I'm sitting here. What if we throw her a birthday party? Well, Harry kind of got a little grin on his face. And he goes, you know, that, that'd be nice, I think. That'd be real nice. And he yells to the back and calls his wife. And his wife comes out. And he goes, hey, this, this guy here wants to throw Agnes a birthday party tomorrow. And that's when Harry's wife spoke up. And she says, oh, Agnes, she's, sweet. she's, sweet. she's always, so sweet. She's always trying to help everybody else. And ah, that'd be great. Let's do it. Let's, let's throw her a birthday party. Well, they planned it out, and Harry said, well, I'm going to be the one to bake the cake. And, and Tony said, well, I'll go out, and I'll find some decorations, and, uh, and I'll bring them in. We'll, we'll get here kind of early at maybe 2.30 or so and, and get it all set up. It sound good tomorrow night. And Harry's like, yeah, that's the plan. Let's do it. So the next, next evening at 2.30, 2.30 in the morning, 
Tony comes in with all his decorations. They start to put it up all over the place. And, and about a quarter till three, some women start to file in. Tony finds out that Harry had gotten the word out on the street. And it wasn't just the eight or nine prostitutes who had come in earlier. Now the whole, sh- the whole store was completely packed full of prostitutes coming to celebrate Agnes's birthday. After a little while, the, the door opens and, and here comes Agnes and her friends. It's a great surprise. They all yell, surprise, happy birthday, Agnes. And her eyes lit up. She couldn't believe all that was being done for her. And she walks over to the counter and, and, and Harry brings out the cake. Harry puts the cake in front of her and, and lights the candles and says, Agnes, blow out the candles. Come on, let's blow out the candles and we'll cut the cake. But Agnes just stood there staring at the cake. The tears started coming down her eyes. And again, Harry says, come on, Agnes, blow out the candles. Let's cut the cake. And and that's when Agnes kind of stutters. "Can can Can we just not cut it just yet? Harry's like, do whatever you want to. It's your cake. And you can take it home if you want to. And Agnes, can I really? And Harry's like, yeah, take it home. It's your cake. And Agnes says, I, I, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. I promise you I'll be right back. And she carefully picks up the cake and gently carries it out the door and down the street to her apartment. Well, after she left, you can imagine everybody's just kind of standing there not knowing what to do. And that's when Tony says he didn't quite know what to do, but he did what he guess any pastor would end up doing. He stepped up on the on one of the benches and says, okay, let's all pray. Everybody was a little bit surprised, but nevertheless, they all bowed their heads, and Tony says he went into this prayer for Agnes. God, we pray that you'll take care of Agnes. We pray that you'll protect her, that you'll love her, that you'll help her, you'll change her life, you'll give her a good life, that she will come to know Jesus. And he prayed this whole long prayer just for Agnes. And then he said amen. And when he said amen and stepped down, Harry comes over and leans in next to him and says, you didn't tell me you're a preacher. (laughs) And then Harry asked him, he says, what kind of church you belong to anyway? And Tony says that's when he felt like he had just the right words given to him at the right moment. He says, I come from the kind of church that likes to throw parties for prostitutes at three in the morning. (laughs) Harry said, I want to go to that church. (laughs) Jesus partied. Jesus partied, and the reason he had a party was to bring people to himself. Guys, we are a partying church. We party... At throwback, and I get calls. Pastors, I can't believe you're doing that in church. I can't believe you guys would sing that song. I can't believe you guys would throw eggs out. I can't believe you guys would do fireworks. I can't believe you. We are a partying church. But the reason we party, the reason we party is simply so we can bring people to Jesus. So let's get up out of our seats out of our seats, not sit in our comfort zone and party for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Begins with a friend, a friend named Jesus. If you don't know him, then you don't know his love. No amount of, nothing will move. Nothing will move, but only because of his love do we step out, do we move. If you've never asked Jesus into your heart, friend, please, here now, call out to him. He hears you. He knows you. Say, Jesus, I do believe you died for me. And right now, the best I know how, I'm receiving you as my Savior. Come into my life and forgive me of my sin. And be my God, my Savior, my friend. And say, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. See the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Know the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it compels us. It moves us. Father, help us to go out. Help us to move out of our seats to be the church, the people you want us to be to those in need, to those who need to know your son, Jesus. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen.